Well, thank you, Xanders, for that introduction, and thank you all for attending this webinar. So I'm going to be introducing a, uh, a restoration study that took place in a warm, dry, mixed conifer forest in southern Arizona. I'll first define mixed conifer and then talk about some of the, um, the um, um, treatment effects that we saw over the, um, uh, the last 10 years. And then I'll touch on some of the management implications. So for starters, mixed conifer forests of the Southwest are highly variable, as Xander said, and broadly represent the transition zone between ponderosa pine and spruce fir forests. They are found along a gradient of conditions that result in a wide range of species composition, complex fuel characteristics, and natural disturbance regimes. Historically, fires in these forests varied from low frequent to infrequent fire regimes. Not all these forests are highly variable, or wait, all these forests are highly variable in their, in their overstory composition, but they're also highly variable in, in terms of their associated understory, which can be quite different as well. Here, where's my pointer at? Here we see um, two mixed conifer forests, one with an associated bunch grass system, and the other, another dry mixed conifer forest with the um, dominated shrub community. Mixed conifer forests in the Southwest uh, only make up about eight to 12% of the forested land, most of which are in the um, San Juan and Sangre de Cristo Mountains. Generally, mixed conifer forests are divided in two groups, the warm, dry, and cool, moist, representing the ends of a xeric mesic continuum. These two forest types are distinguished by their species composition with more xeric species, such as ponderosa pine in the warm dry, though we do see aspen and white fir in these forests as well, sort of like what we're seeing in this photo right here. Um, and cool moist forests are usually dominated by shade tolerant species. The species in these two forest types represent adaptations to fire with the fire tolerant species more prevalent in the mixed in the warm dry and less fire tolerant species in the cool moist. <clears throat> this study uh, focused on the warm dry mixed conifer forest type specific to the San Juan um, National Forest. Fire studies in the area suggest that these forests were historically maintained by somewhat frequent fires. But again, I got to emphasize just how variable these fire regimes are. For those of you not familiar with fire uh, history studies, each tick here represents a fire or an individual fire on a sample. These are all samples, these horizontal lines. And at the Grassy Knoll uh, site we see, or the Grassy Mountain site, we see fires were fairly frequent, roughly um, uh, 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 a mean fire in interval of 10, uh, 10 years. Whereas the lower middle mountain where this, where this particular study is gonna take place and Jackson Mountain, we see fire intervals on, on order of 30 to 24 years. One thing that's consistent across these sites Fires seem to stop about the same time, right around 1870, and that's noted here in this red line. And from here, I'm sure most of you are familiar with the Ponderosa Pine story and forest conditions following fire exclusion, where forests become more dense, diameter distributions shift towards smaller trees, and plant production is reduced, and there's over 100 years of, um, of fuel accumulation. Except in these forests, not only have for, the forests become more dense, but the composition has shifted, tending towards, um, shifting towards these low uh, sweeping species such as white fir. With climate change in the Southwest, projects to support more, wait, blah, blah, blah. With climate change in the Southwest projected to support more drought and fire, it seems logical restoration treatments that include fire and thinning plus fire, like those used in the ponderosa pine fork could reverse some of the fire exclusion effects that we have seen over the last 140 years. 
Prior to this study, there had only been a few documented examples of respiratory treatments in Southwest mixed conifer forests. Most of the study examples were out of the Grand Canyon National Park using fire use. There were some examples in the Sierra Nevadas and Cascades, but restoration in Southwest forests um, was just getting started about 20 years ago. So this restoration study was located in Lower Middle Mountain, northwest of um, Pagosa Springs. The study site was a random block design where, with four blocks, each with the control, burn, and thin and burn unit. Each unit was about 16 hectares or 40 acres. Pretreatment data was collected in 2003 across 240 sample plots. In 2004, thinning units were thinned by hand and all wood was left on the site due to road restrictions and difficulty of getting logging trucks up in the area. Mostly white fir and Douglas fir were cut due to the low numbers of ponderosa pine that were previously selectively harvested in the 1990s. Here in this photo, we see some decent sized logs that remained on the ground. Most of these are all what looks like um, white fir. And they're, even though they are large in size, they're all fairly young, uh, less than probably 85 years old. Thinning followed an evidence-based prescription where all living trees that established before 1870 were not cut. Aspen were also not cut because we assume most of them be killed in the fire. In addition to retaining all old trees, an average of two younger trees of the same species were also retained as replacements for dead old trees or stumps or any kind of evidence that would uh, indicate um, something prior to 1870. The cost for thinning these units was about $930 an acre or roughly $400 an acre, or excuse me, $930 a hectare or roughly $400 an acre. Um, in 2007 and 2008, prescribed fire was applied to treated units using strip head fires. Only half the units were burned in 2007 because smoke got a bit out of hand and was blowing into the town of Pagosa, so things had to shut down. The remaining units were burned in the following fall. There was a lot of variability with these prescribed fires. We had some low intense fires um, just kind of creeping along the ground. There was definitely some crown torching and uh, hopefully Matt will tell us some stories about these. And then there's definitely um, some areas that burn really hot, um, created a lot of resident heat uh, due to some of the heavies on the ground. The cost for burning these units was about $370 a hectare or $150 an acre. So our two main questions were, how do shrub and tree regeneration and forest floor and overstory fuels vary among alternative restoration treatments one, five, and 10 years post-treatment? And how do understory plant richness, diversity, abundance, and community, dyna community dynamics differ among various restoration treatments one and 10 years post-treatment? Results. These graphs show changes in forest structure characteristics. The uh, gray bars here are uh, when um, treatments were completed. The thin and burn units uh, initially reduced trees by uh, 70 to 80%, 70 to 88% whereas the uh, burn units reduced trees by 28 to 44, 43%. As we look at these responses over the, over the post 10 years, tree density, basal area, and canopy cover were consistent lower in the um, thin and burn compared to the burn and controls. Crown base height was higher in the thin and burn compared to the burn only and control treatments. But these trends start to diminish um, 10 years post-treatment. 
Um, tree density in the thin and burn increased by 50% from 2009 to uh, 2018. And crown base, um, uh, crown base uh, was higher. Wait, crown base uh, in the thin and burn area started to um, lower mainly to, due to the ingrowth of acin. Burn only also reduced tree density and basal area, but had minimal effects on canopy cover and crown base height. Canopy fuels and surface fuels. Initially, canopy fuels were reduced by 75% in the thin and burn compared to 23% in the burn only. Initial treatment responses were generally maintained over the 10 years across all treatments. Where the thin and burn was consistently lower and burn only remained similar to the controls. Surface fuels continued to increase regardless of treatment type. And by 2018, there was a one and a half to two and a half times more fuels than pretreatment conditions. Understory development. We found trends of understory diversity increasing 10 years after treatment in the thin and burn and decreasing in controls and burn treatments. There were no um, treatment effects for species richness or plant uh, cover. However, we did see time effects uh, where species richness declined and plant cover increased regardless of uh, treatment type. In 2018, uh, almost all the plant cover was native. Canadian thistle was the most, or Canadian thistle, what's that? Circium arventus was the most prevalent non-native species and was found on 21% of the burn plots or 21% of the thin and burn plots and 4% um, of the burn plots. Here are some cool photos that um, Julie Corbin and her students at Fort Lewis uh, College uh, took. These are camera traps uh, showing some cool wildlife use across all three treatments. There's a mountain lion in the control, a fox in the burn, and, uh, and a bear in the thin and burn. Thought that was pretty, uh, pretty neat stuff. Um, these areas are definitely being utilized uh, by a lot of uh, Julie students um, doing um, specific or you know, student projects. So um, a lot of good information coming out of this uh, demonstration area. Increase in herbaceous plant cover were pr primarily driven by perennial grasses um, within all treatments. We even saw a doubling of graminoid cover over the um, post-treatment duration. We also saw increases in perennial forbs in the thin and burn treatment. Here we have an indicator species analysis showing what species were dominant for both treatment and time. The highest number of indicators were in the thin and burn. And interestingly, the only indicators for time were in 2018 and all grass or all graminoids. However, when it came to the understory, it was the shrub response that was prolific. Regardless of treatment type, shrubs increased fourfold. Uh, over the 10-year po uh, post-treatment duration. Here are some more of those um, uh, camera traps with wildlife in them, but really take a notice uh, just how dense the thickets of shrubs are in each treatment. Not only did shrubs increase in density, uh, but they got taller too. Um, here we have the proportion of shrubs um, and this shows that um, shrubs shifted in the thin and burn towards uh, uh, the, the, the tallest height class. There were three main shrub species that drove this uh, prolific response. Serviceberry, which significantly increased in the controls. That's noted here with the uh, bold texting. Gamble oak, which was a species in the thin and burn area that really took off and shifted that height distribution. They increased significantly both in the thin and burn and controls. 
and snow bearing, which also increased significantly in the controls and thin burn. Conifer seedlings increased steadily over the post-treatment um, duration, but by 2018, there was a difference in seedling density between the um, control and burn compared to the thin and burn. Ponderosa supplying seedlings uh, increased in all treatments. And while they increased a, in a order of magnitude in the control and the uh, burn, they also significantly increased in the thin and burn. Douglas Ford uh, did well and in increased significantly in the control. And Aspen, although it wasn't significant, responded well in the thin and burn units. Almost a, um, almost a fourfold increase there. So now I'm gonna get a little bit into some management implications, um, but this is where um, Matt is really gonna take off and, and discuss some of this uh, information and hopefully answer all the hard questions. The thin and burn treatment effects were still evident 10 years post-treatment. They improved forest structure and reduced canopy fuels, likely reducing potential fire behavior. However, these effects seem to be fading as oak and aspen continue to increase and grow and surface fuels continue to accumulate. Burn only did alter the forest structure, but had minimal effects on canopy fuels and canopy structure, not, not really improving conditions for future fire behavior. Implications for biodiversity, there were no strong treatment effects for improving understory richness or cover, though there were indications of increased diversity in the thin and burn, where the highest number of indicator species were identified. Graminoids seemed to respond well over the last 10 years, regardless of treatments, and shrub response dominated the understory over all, across all treatments. This seems to suggest that time or possibly climate change had a stronger effect on biodiversity than treatments alone. Management implications for susceptibility to tight conversion. This is where things get a little tricky. Um, ecosystems undergoing tight conversions are gonna be strongly dependent on the magnitude of a disturbance or the magnitude of climate change and obviously time. Here in this study, in this 10 year, year study, which is pretty much short duration, sprouting shrubs continue to increase regardless of treatment. Individual shrub species increase in both the control and thin and burn, but gamble oaks seem to really take off in the thin and burn areas. It's possible that this prolific oak response could be lim limiting conifer regeneration in the thin and burn areas. However, we did see increases in pine seedlings in these treatments over the 10 years. But whether that's sufficient enough, well, that's a question that would probably be best answered with future monitoring to better understand interactions of climate and competition with these uh, different veg layers. Here, I just basically simplified things and showed increasing, decreasing, neutral effects for each treatment. Basically, burn and control had neutral effects on fire behavior, biodiversity, and, and type conversion. And the thin and burn over the last 10, 10 years reduced potential fire behavior, had a neutral, neutral effect to slight effect on biodiversity and I'm gonna leave it at uh, questionable effects on type conversion. Last, I just wanna acknowledge all those contributed to this project, uh, the collaboration between the Forest Service, state agencies, all the academic institutes was instrumental in, in the success of this project. Couldn't happen. Um, and uh, I thank you so much for everyone's help. And I'll leave off there. Thank you so much, Mike. Um, and Matt, we wanna bring you into the conversation here. 
Uh, do you want to try to share any photos or should we use um, mics as a backdrop? I've got some slides, so we can just jump to mine. Okay. Uh, we'll see how this goes. All right, are you seeing? Yeah, right now we're seeing like the, the presenter view. Oh. There we go, perfect. All right. One second, move some of these boxes around. Um, all right, well, thank, thanks for giving me the opportunity to talk today. I, I think Mike explained well that there are definitely some unresolved questions and some surprises when we start managing mixed content for us. Like you mentioned, the, uh, the prescribed fire um, was definitely exciting for folks on, on this Ranger district. Probably the uh, prescribed burn of legend with spot fires and smoke inhalation and all sorts of crazy things. So um, that was one lesson learned. Um, but when we see results like what, what Mike led or Mike presented, we, we think about, do we really want this? Would you rather have something else? Um, is this acceptable here? Would it work in other places? And then I think a big one is what we do next after some of this happens. And so today I wanna to share some of this decision space around how we manage mixed counter reports, knowing we don't really have all the answers because we do make decisions to manage these for us either directly like in Middle Mountain or just indirectly by not doing anything. Um, and from my perspective, there really isn't a right way or a correct way to do things that are only really better or worse options in some places than others. Um, and a really big need to think about the long-term trajectory of how these things are going to respond. So I'm going to try to keep it interesting. And you know it could get that way when the government force or quotes a nihilist philosopher in its first slide. Um, but I think it's, it's, it's good because um, these are complicated forests. You have some forests like this around Pagosa, similar to Middle Mountain. This is warm, dry, mixed conifer with dominant ponderosa pine and dug fir. Sandy clay loam soils, um, fairly productive and lots of shrubs, typically gamble oak around here that re-sprout. Um, but then a, a short distance away, you can have places like this with really shallow soils, still fairly productive um, stands for trees, but much less of a gambolo component and only a really a little bit of snowberry, lots of bare soil. And then a place like this can literally be hundreds of feet from a stand like this, which we wouldn't even call warm dry mixed conifer. We'd probably call this cold wet mixed conifer. This is actually one of the best blue spruce sites that we have around here. Um, and these mixed conifer forests tend to be uh, an encyclopedia of tree, insect, and diseases, um, which are all really active around here. So spruce budworm being a huge one, defoliating trees for the last couple decades, and then variable impacts from Douglas fir beetle. Here behind my coworker here is a huge Douglas fir that fell down. Um, stand heights in here are around 120, 130 feet. Um, and so we've got all sorts of other things happening while we're trying to decide what to do for, for the long term. And then you can have places like this that technically qualifies warm dry mixed conifer. But here we got a place that um, is a mixed conifer stand on an alluvial fan with really excessively drained soils that makes this a mixed conifer site with dominant pine. But this place is surrounded by spruce fir and mountain meadows. So much different conditions. And not only is this complicated, but th then you get into disturbance patterns and trajectories. Um, they're super complicated. Um, warm, dry mixed conifer forests, like the type we see in Middle Mountain, can shift from uh, a condition pre-treatment on Middle Mountain to an aspen stand or a wet mixed conifer forest, depending on where we're starting and what happens with wildfire. Um, at fine scales, re-sprouting shrubs can be a huge consideration, or they could be no consideration at all. And all these disturbances are influenced by terrain, microclimate, soils, and even things like the randomness of a fire start on a windy, windy day in a dry year. And then, then you got to consider the crazy ideas some of my predecessors had back in the 60s when we wanted to convert all these forests to an even age structure 
um, which is always really fun to deal with when we're talking about reference conditions. And I think if there's any constant across all these forests, it's that in the absence of wildfire that Mike pointed out, we've we basically create a condition where there's a lot of closed canopy, late serial forest structure with a lot of shade tolerant trees like white fir and Douglas fir. And we know that these conditions are really primed for a, a broad scale, potentially severe fire in a, in a really dry year. And I'll talk a little bit more about some of that that we've seen. And, and while there's some historical precedent for these big severe fires, I think we all agree that we don't necessarily want that in all places, even though it might be acceptable in others. And so how do we decide what to do? Well, I'm here to say that the context is really important. It, we, there really isn't any one thing that we do in every place, and you really need to look at the big picture in, either, in order to decide what to do. Um, and that may drive what's being done more than anything. So, so let's take a closer look at the middle mountain site um, that Mike described. I mean, this is a moderately steep south facing slope. Um, it's relatively consistent stand conditions. Um, has a lot, lot of gamble oak, um, but just upslope of this stand, you're, you become uh, into a cool, moist, mixed conifer, spruce fir forest. Um, down on the sides, you're basically in rugged, inaccessible canyons that most likely will never be managed. And they also tend to be spotted owl habitat in this part of the world. Um, you should also be able to tell from this slide that there's roads within the study area, um, which were put there back in the 60s and used then and also in the 90s. So this is an actively managed um, area over time. And until about the 1990s, forest products were really the focus in, in this part of, of the forest. Um, but really kind of that objective dried up a little bit into the, the 2000s, early 2000s at the time of this study, and thus none of the trees were removed. Um, but, but if you zoom out a little bit, you notice that Middle Mountain's five, six miles away from the wildland urban interface. Um, I'm actually in this cluster of dots over here um, speaking right now. This is where my home's located. Um, Middle Mountain's adjacent to a roadless area, which was a concern for, for some of the early logging or for the logging that Mike mentioned. Um, and that's adjacent to a 60,000 acre specially designated management area that's managed essentially as wilderness. Um, so, so that's relevant. Um, this Eastern half of the study or this landscape right here has actually been extensively managed. Um, Ponderosa pine, pretty high crown base heights, not very dense, um, adjacent to the Wui. And this western half of this map is actually a, a landscape classified as suitable for timber production in a 2013 management plan with, with a regularly scheduled timber harvest program with a goal of one. Um, and we, we also have plans to do some timber harvesting and fields reduction in this big sort of potato shaped mountain in the center called Chris Mountain that also has relatively good roads and has already been partially treated as you can see down in the, that sort of Southwest corner. Um, so this is stuff we need to consider. Another context factor is that um, forest products are starting to matter. I mean, here's something you might not ever think about in the Southern Rockies. Um, this is plywood veneer manufacturing taking place in Dolores, Colorado. This is a new business that's come online that really is looking for white fur to create cores for plywood up in the Pacific Northwest. And then these cores here on the right are actually sold as posts for um, various uses locally. And on top of this, we, we also have a, a stud mill um, located in Western Colorado. And white fur of the sort in abundance in these forests is used for dimensional lumber. Um, and these are the formerly cheap white wood grade stamp studs you'd see at Home Depot or Lowe's or your lumber yard. They used to be about three bucks and now they're about nine to 10 bucks. So now there's a little bit more interest in some of this wood for creating studs. And a, and a big lesson I think I've learned here is that when we make this material available, Industry will invest in doing this kind of work, and we can move that $400 an acre cost 
into a at least break even or possibly even um, net profit um, situation. And so here's those are some things to consider. I don't really have all the answers, um, but we have some ideas about what works and what doesn't. Here's a shot of the Missionary Ridge fire, a fire that burned back in, I believe, 2003. And a couple of years prior, nobody in Durango, where this is near, would ever think about cutting all of the conifers in a thousands of acres uh, footprint, um, put a whole bunch of people's lives in danger, spend $40 million in the, in the course of a month in doing that, and then spend another $100 million over the next 20 years trying to rehabilitate the site and trying to get conifers to grow again in that landscape. Well, the story for this fire isn't all negative, like we're seeing some resprouting aspen here. Um, this isn't necessarily what we wanted. And so the answer to managing these forests shouldn't always be, in my opinion, that we'll focus on these drier types, these more frequent fire adapted forests, and just see what happens in these mixed conifer forests. Um, because this is often what we could get, and we've got some evidence that this is what we're going to get if we keep a hands off perspective. So with that, I'll jump into some considerations, um, recognizing there's not one single right answer, that there's a range of options. I think the big first one is that we really need a, a plan to manage wildfire. Um, it's not really if, it's when these places are gonna burn um, without a plan. And if, if we can at least anticipate these fires um, by using potential operational delineations of pods, um, pre-planning for wildfire, um, we can try a bunch of different things in Middle Mountain and be assured that we're not uh, missing the mark in our prioritization. Um, in this landscape, the, the protected area is actually that pine landscape to the east of Middle Mountain. It's not really in the Middle Mountain area. So, so some of the areas that we're going to use to manage wildfire aren't actually in sites like Middle Mountain that we described. They're, they're well outside adjacent to the community. I think another thing we need to pay attention to is how much ground do we really have that can be managed? Um, how much is it relative to the total forest? And are we managing it all the same way? On the San Juan, ground suitable for management is approximately 20% or a fifth of the forest. Um, and it's probably even less than that when we start getting a little bit finer scale. And so while we don't really know exactly what's going to happen by doing every different type of management action. We definitely could try some things to make sure we're not going all in on one approach. And I think efforts like Middle Mountain, um, while we might not want to try something like that in the wildland urban interface, we can learn a lot, maybe accomplish other objectives when we try some of that stuff in the, in the back 40, like on Middle Mountain. I think we also need to be open to using industry where we can help. Um, today, we'd probably sell all of that white fur that was slashed and burned in Middle Mountain. And we probably might have different fire facts had we done that. Um, and I really think that with, with some, some effort, uh, we might even be able to refine a silviculture system that allows us to maintain different structure across the landscape while sustainably producing white fur for local industry. Um, as white fur grows fast, it's easy to grow. We don't even have to try. Um, and, and while things don't grow really fast in our part of the world, we have a lot of space and we could potentially substitute some of the, the space we have for the time it takes to grow trees. Um, I, I think another consideration is that we need to stay humble. All of these concepts could be crazy ideas and I need people like Mike and the ERI and CSU to tell me when I'm crazy. Um, I, I sometimes believe things are going to happen that don't happen. Like I was sort of amazed that in 10 years, we did not get more pine establishment in a thin and burn. I almost don't believe it. They must've used too small of a fixed plot. I don't know what happened, um, but sometimes we're just wrong. And I think science really builds credibility and everybody needs credibility, especially the forest service. And so not only are we working with, with NAU, but we're working with folks at CSU, Colorado State on an adaptive silviculture for climate change project. We're, we're, we're looking at similar treatments in a nearby forest, actually Jackson Mountain, one Mike mentioned, 
I um, mean, and we're tracking various levels of canopy cover retention and retention of shade tolerant trees like white fir to see what happens, um, particularly in a, in a warmer, um, potentially drier climate. So that's the kind of thing you need to do to, to cover your back, make sure you're keeping your blind spot covered. And I think the last thing I'll mention is that um, we really take, we really need to take a long view with regard to humanity's efforts to manage mixed conifer forests. We've really only been at this for about 70 years at most. Um, most of the, the early management of forests up here didn't want to go into mixed conifer forests because they were too wet, they were too rugged, they were too brushy, and they'd rather focus on this open ponderosa pine forest where we could get logs out really quickly. And so we, we really don't have a whole lot of experience to learn from, but, but I think we definitely know some things that don't work, and I believe we know enough that we can try some things and get better over time. And we're really part of this long story of humans adapting to this forest landscape, this fire adapted forest landscape. And we're really just in the early chapters for figuring it out. So um, I think that's great. It's a great time to be a forester here. And we got a lot of folks paying attention and being engaged in some of the work we're doing. So with that, I will keep quiet and we can go to questions. Great. Well, thank you, Matt, and, and Mike as well. I, I think uh, really interesting to see uh, both the, the scientific data and the, the, uh, the charts as well as uh, Matt kind of hear uh, your perspective. And I, I hadn't known about the, uh, the mill and Dolores, so I, I consider that good news. Um, we've got a couple of questions coming in. Um, one just kind of quick um, clarification. How long after the thinning was the prescribed burning done? Mike probably has a better hand on that one specifically. So, um, I believe thinning happened in 2003. Um, and let me just look at this. Thinning happened in 2003 and, uh, and uh, 2004 and prescribed fire happened in 2007, 2008. So about three, four years in between. Yep. And, and, and I'll just mention that uh, a big constraint here in Pagosa Springs was that the smoke from this wildfire tends to want to settle in Pagosa Springs, which is sort of a basin. Um, Colorado has some pretty strict air quality standards. And so it was really hard to even burn a few hundred acres with heavy fuels like this in uh, even in, even in a single year, single season. So it took a little while to accomplish. Um, and, I, and I know folks here struggled to try to get some of that work done. Well, maybe Matt, that's a good lead in. Um, John Paul asked about plans for prescribed fire re-entry at Middle Mountain. And maybe you can build on, so uh, <laughs> Mike talked quite a bit about the, the shrubs coming back in. Um, and I, I do think I was interested in the aspen component because um, that I think plays into our prescribed fire thinking quite a bit. But given that that those shrubs, given the the rest of the context, um, how how are you guys thinking, sort of as a larger community, about uh, reentry for prescribed fire on Middle Mountain? Yeah, I I think. At a starting point, we want to definitely coordinate with, with some of these folks who've got a lot invested in this research project on any next steps. And so I think we haven't quite gotten to where we're proposing the, the next entry um, into this stand, but I think we're, we're well prepared. The forest has done a, a bit of analysis to facilitate some prescribed fire or even me mechanized uh, mastication type treatments if we wanted to go that route. Um, um, but we, we really don't have that laid out yet. We're still in those conversations. Um, I, I do think in similar forests, what we've seen is that we would try to use some type of mastication treatment in order to moderate some of those um, potential extreme fire, fire behavior effects that could, could occur during a burn in, in some of this thick um, gamble oak. But I think we're learning that if we have a pretty narrow window about 
four to seven years where if we don't get in there with prescribed fire, then we might need a, a mechanized treatment. And so I think there's a component of timing with, with all these entries that needs to be accounted for. And it becomes a pretty complex endeavor when you're managing a really big landscape and certain years you, you can't burn for all kinds of reasons. And so um, I'd like to hear Mike's thoughts on that. Like, where do we want to go with this um, for the next 10 years, Mike? Well, I think these, um, these, these demonstration projects are great resources uh, to get ahead of uh, management. So, I mean, we, we have the experimental design. I think we could uh, actually come in and uh, apply some treatments that might be, you know, feasible at a um, management level. You know, maybe even uh, some mastication, kind of nested designs within this, uh, this experiment, um, this demonstration. So, I mean, it would be a matter of, like you said, getting, getting all the right people together, <clears throat> getting all the cards together and, um, you know, trying out some of these, uh, these, these treatments. Uh, one thing I think that could probably work is, you know, um, fire, but at a very localized, intense uh, solution where you're just burning holes, you know, probably in the spring. So you can really uh, hit those, um, those, um, those shrub carbohydrate resources underground. And that might help open up some of the, can uh, the um, that mid story. And then uh, Colorado seems to be real often using um, mastication. So we, we could definitely look at some of those uh, effects. But to try and uh, broadcast burn in this particular area, uh, well, I think we missed the boat on that one. <laughs> Once you say Matt, um, and especially, I mean, I'd love to hear uh, you talk about some of the initial uh, burn effects. You know, that 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 got a lot of people in a in a pucker situation that um, seem to uh, still have stories re resonating since over the last twenty years. Yeah, I mean, it, it's true, and I think you you had a couple photos in there that sort of demonstrated. <laughs> <laughs> why there were so many stories. Um, when, when I first mentioned, I think this was one or two years ago when Julie Corp, one of the uh, PIs on this study, she mentioned, hey, let's talk about potentially burning this, mentioned it some, to some of our fire staff and they were, the response was no way. <laughs> it's just like, but, and then I heard all the stories about how we had all kinds of trouble, spot fires, more spot fires than they've ever seen from any prescribed fire, um, flame lengths, potential escape, all kinds of things. Um, that said, I, I think we're, we're still open to, to trying some things. Um, like Mike said, I think just putting fire in there right now might be a little bit more risk than we really want to bite off. Um, but thankfully, we're in a landscape where we're not adjacent to homes and we've got a little ability to try some things. And so we're definitely open to conversations. And we're going to be clear to try uh, mechanical treatments if we'd like in, in this landscape um, in, the, in the next few months based on some current planning efforts. Great. And I want to uh, pull out some other comments that came in in the chat window. Uh, Thomas Timberlake added, um, in addition to making management more, more complicated and perhaps more fun, it seems like all the diversity from this that uh, you talked about sort of stand to stand or within a stand contributes to this sort of response diversity as we treat or, or as these forests change over time. And so, you know, at least in the literature, uh, that contributes to resilience because you just have more, uh, maybe going back to the egg analogy, right? More eggs in different baskets. Um, so I think that's a, an important thing to kind of keep in mind uh, uh, as we, we talk about whether, you know, mastication in one spot or, or fire in another. Um, and then Thomas went on with a more specific question um, just about the climate following the treatment. So I guess following that prescribed fire, was it um, trying to remember back, uh, I think it was a little bit of a wetter period. Um, and, you know, did that post-treatment climate kind of uh, put these stands on a particular trajectory, or if it had, regardless of the climate, would would sort of the, that shrub layer have boomed back anyway? 
And maybe that's, uh, I don't know who, me neither <laughs> you want to dive in on that, but maybe just a guess. Yeah, I, I couldn't speak to exactly how the time period compares to, you know, a, a broader, let's say, 30-year time period. I can say, though, that the climate predictions for this part of the world are that um, we're, we're going to be warmer and we're likely to have really, really big precipitation events and then really, really dry droughts. And in some cases, back to back, and we've seen some of that here just in the time I've lived in Pagosa Springs, some of the wettest years and some of the driest years within a five-year period. And I think um, how that comes into play, I don't know, but, but I do think that one of our most um, resilient species in this entire forest is gamble oak. I mean, these trees retain such a, a, a vast amount of carbohydrate in their roots, and they're able to hang out in that understory for years and years and years and wait for, for a canopy opening. And when we, we give it to them, we've shown that they can establish. So I don't know if you have any thoughts, Mike. I think it's interesting how gamble oak grows in that neck of the world. Um, they, they seem to be really um, sprouting type species. Um, and when we see it here in Arizona, but I mean, we also see these large gamble oak structures. And, and from what I recall working in the, um, the Middle Mountain area, I never really saw any of those large oak structures. They're all in this kind of like this, this shrub form. Matter of fact, um, when we don't even consider uh, gamble oak up in uh, Colorado, in that part of Colorado, one of the uh, overstory species, uh, we, we've always kind of uh, st stuck them in the understory uh, component. Whereas here in Arizona, they're, they're, they're pretty much a, um, a dominant overstory species and make up pine, pine oak uh, communities. So just really interesting how they take on a different structure there. And I, I saw Michael Renke was in this uh, um, in the audience, and I, I once heard that he was going to make this a, a lifetime um, um, project to figure out the question why the structure between these two regions are different for Gamble Oak. I wonder if he uh, ever made any headway on this. Oh man, put me on the spot about Gamble Oak. No, it, it's it's really quite fascinating, and, and you know. I, I study a lot of these systems from a soils perspective and something I've been really curious about is this monsoonal gradient concept of like in Arizona on the Mogollon Rim, you have these strong monsoonal precipitation patterns where you end up with this, this great tree-like oak. And then as you creep into the San Juan Mountains where these study sites are, we really actually end up with both. At Middle Mountain, it's mostly in the shrub form, but there's certain spaces and geographies where we still do have really large trees of gamble oak, particularly in, in valley bottoms. And, um, and then you keep moving north and out of where monsoonal precipitation dominates and you end up with like strictly shrub form gamble oak. And so something I've been really curious about is, is there this story of mycorrhizal relationships and water and where that water is coming from, i.e. snow dominated versus monsoon dominated or a mix of that water precipitation source. So I don't know, I think there's a lot of fascinating hypotheses and you know, Guterman and, and Chris Ruse have been doing some great work on the shrub fields and the Hama is really showing that uh, anthropogenic fire suppression followed by uh, disturbance really favors sprouting shrubs and that like strong shift in like, there's no fire, there's no fire, there's no fire. And then disturbance seems to be their leading hypothesis of, uh, sprouting shrub dominance and uh, to me it's all fascinating like this is such a great question and, and if you spend time in northern Arizona and then come to southwest Colorado the Campbell Oak is definitely a bit of a head scratcher like well this is like a completely different species so this is it's it's really good stuff it's fascinating to think about and I, I crawled through the the oak at um, lower middle mountain for the 2018 data set and it is impressive how thick it is <laughs> wild <laughs> yeah thank you for sharing that i think um it what we're, we should probably try to wrap up here at the top of the hour but i guess my one of my takeaways here is the importance of the science management partnership and continuing 
to uh, study these things and, and, and try to really pick out those patterns uh, because uh, clearly it's super complex and only becoming more complex as uh, our uh, climate change speeds up. So um, I wanna take the opportunity to uh, thank you both, Matt, Mike, uh, and also all our participants, good, good feedback today. Uh, really interesting to share this and uh, feels like, uh, I don't know, maybe we need a follow on with, um, we could get uh, uh, Ruse and Gitterman to come on and, and talk about their, uh, some of their Jemez shrub field work. Maybe that would be a good companion because there's more to learn clearly. Hey, thanks a lot. I appreciate the opportunity. Yeah, thank you guys and uh, love those questions. Uh, definitely going to stimulate some, uh, hopefully some more questions <laughs> and um, yeah, thanks. Great, well, thanks everybody. I look forward to seeing everybody on a future webinar.